Hi, so whilst I've been at home hacking my guts up, I noticed a tweet today asking what the metric for WoW success is, if not subscriber numbers. The answer I think is straightforward enough, if a short answer is required, but it's worth discussing. I'd like to, in between coughing fits, explain the obvious profit metric which drives every business, the fun metric which Ian has Hazacostas frequently brings up, and the non-metric which in reality determines the success and failure of many people in many different businesses. And why should Blizzard be any different? So, in terms of subscribers not being important, this is essentially true. What matters to a business is, of course, profit. Now, we may or may not like to think of our beloved developers being above such money grubbing, but it makes no difference. They aren't in charge. They do as they're told, just like everybody else. As a teacher, I have quite a lot of autonomy in my work, but I still get told what I have to teach and a pretty long list of things I'm not allowed to do or say on the side. Likewise with the developers. They have a level of autonomy as long as the bottom line is met. So why don't subscribers strictly matter? At the start of WoW, a customer bought the box game and then paid a subscription every month. Now, there are ways to extract money from the more committed players that didn't exist back then. And more casual players are much less likely to pay a subscription every month when the MMO genre in general offers free-to-play options and that has become much more the standard. For example, for quite a long time from the release of the WoW token, I already had two accounts and would also get a WoW token each month for extra gold because I couldn't be asked farming the gold itself. Now, a WoW token costs roughly double a monthly subscription but grants a user just one month of playtime. So, paying for two accounts and a WoW token meant that I was basically worth four subscribers. In a situation like this, what value is there in paying attention to the number of active subscribers? They have also been wrestling with the issue of casual players only subbing for a month every now and then, like King Canute trying to order back the tide. They time-gated the shit out of content, brought out regular content patches throughout Legion, even offered up a ghostly pirate ship if only you'll sign on the dotted line in blood for the next six months. So, the people in charge of the company are only interested in money. Most investors won't even know anything about the product, other than it gives them a great return. So as long as it remains highly profitable, which thus far it has, then those people are happy. Well, if not happy, then at least mildly content. I suspect the majority of such people are never truly happy if they know there is money in the world that isn't theirs. So then there's the so-called fun metric. On at least one occasion that I can recall, Ian Hazacosta said that the only metric he cares about is fun. Whose fun? Is it our fun? If so, how does he ensure that we will have fun with the content and, once released, how does he ascertain that the amount of fun is in line or exceeding his target? What is even the unit of fun? The smiley, I suppose. Naturally, if you're going to try and make something fun for someone, or more specifically a group of someones, then you need to know what they find fun. You do this by asking. So who do they ask? They didn't confer with raiders during the alpha and beta process. They didn't confer with PvP players, world battleground or arena. They didn't confer with dungeoneers. They didn't confer with petal bat enthusiasts. They didn't confer with explorers, achievement hunters or even filthy casuals. Now, as far as I can make out, if they were asking anyone anything, it can only have been each other. So maybe they judge their success on what the World of Warcraft team think of it. Maybe they all fill in their fun forms and the results are tallied and fed directly into Mr. Hazacostas' annual appraisal. Perhaps not. There is another judge of success in workplaces and one that doesn't rely on a metric at all. It's judgment. No, not the iconic ability of the greatest class in fantasy. This judgment is simply that of the senior layer of management. In most workplaces, someone's worth is entirely dependent on the judgment of those immediately senior to them. If there is data and it's good, you can still be judged poor if you're a pain in the ass. If the data is bad, it can easily be excused as the ham-fisted bungling of someone else or simple misfortune, if they like you. Many managers exercise good judgment and effective employees are retained and the department thrives. Some managers exercise poor judgment and then something else happens. Either way, as long as the company makes money, I suspect that the success of any launch is always judged according to the subjective judgment of a manager. Whether that subjective judgment be good or bad, that's an opinion. So I hope you enjoyed this short video. If you did, don't forget to give it a like, click subscribe for further content, share with anyone else who might also be interested, comment down below, and until next time, I'll see you later.